All right, let's pray real quick. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to... Uh, <laughs> we've had so many technical difficulties tonight, it's crazy. Even my phone was just acting so slow that I couldn't look up verses beforehand, really, in an efficient manner. Um, or find, like, my basic spreadsheets that I typically use. So, um, anyway, uh, it'll be what it'll be. Um, but I'll be, like, rapidly word-searching things and asking you guys to look them up for me. So, um, Lord God, we thank you for tonight. And right now, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would calm and quiet us and still us and that you would prepare us to hear from you. Um, regardless of what human words are spoken, Lord God, we ask that your voice would speak loud and clear, that you would illuminate your word, that, um, as David prayed, uh, in Psalm 119, that you would show us wondrous things from your law. And in this case, Lord, just from your word as a whole. Um, in Jesus, we love you. I pray that we would leave tonight uh, edified, strengthened in you, having received everything that you would impart to us, pressed down, double measure, running over. Um, and we ask that we would step away loving you more, more aware of who you are, more aware of your presence in our lives and the way you pursue us. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I actually want to start out with um, the uh, bridge of strong love. Um, so if you guys can look up the what can separate us from the love of Christ, um, I will let you know if I beat you to the reference because, again, I'm looking things up. Romans 8. Everything is in Romans 8. I'll probably read this one aloud just so it's in the mic. Uh, we haven't gotten streaming to work, really, so we're doing like a local recording, and maybe I'll post it later. So my autocorrect makes it Roman apostrophe S8, which means that then when I search it in Blue Letter Bible, it says it doesn't exist because the book's not called Romans with an apostrophe. <laughs> All right. Um, so... Thirty-five, thank you. Wrong chapter. Maybe that's why everything is in Romans 8. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted. Okay, well, yeah, we don't really need to go there, actually. <laughs> but, um, but let's go back to... Um, um, you know, again, what shall separate us? You know, and he lists several things. Uh, what does he list again? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty much everything. Everything in the John Thurlow song, right? Um, so that's very interesting. Um, so just keep that as sort of a backdrop. And um, I want to go to um, Mark chapter 5. This is something you don't often <laughs> have sermons on. Mark chapter 5, and we could go 1 through 20, good long chunk. And one of the things I want to have you ask yourself as you read this is if you were in Jesus' place, would you have done what he did? All right. Um, go for it. The Gadarenes.
Nicopolis. Awesome, thank you. Okay, yeah, there's the Gadarenes and there's the Garristhenes, they're the same thing, um, depending on like uh, which one you're looking at. <laughs> one of the things is there's like alternate names for the same people. Actually, it gets really interesting when you get into like the kings of Israel and stuff, because there'd be like the nicknames, it'd be like King Joshua and King Josh, depending on whether it's King, like Kings or Chronicles and things like that. They were like, wait, were there two of them? No, it's just like variants. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting. Well, I mean, at this point, it's a Roman territory, you know. Um, but uh, so maybe the pigs were Roman pigs. Um, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I. That that is kind of interesting. I mean, maybe it was like uh, <laughs> maybe maybe it was uh, like well, I gotta send them somewhere. So uh, hey, hey, let's do that. I don't know. But uh, but yeah, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, that was interesting because they asked to be sent to the pigs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I mean, I think it's possible that's like the same story, but in one of them they're only focusing on the one guy because he's particularly crazy, <laughs> you know. But, um, but it's interesting, too, because, um, like, think about what it says about other people in relation to this guy. Like, what does it say? You know, they say that nothing could bind him, so people have tried. It sounds like, you know, and uh, and then afterward it talks about like, um, uh, you know, like the people in the region were afraid and they tell Jesus to leave. So like this is a big deal. Like they know about this guy. And of course, they're probably scared by the pigs, too. Um, but just think about yourself in this situation. Like who is the most like unsavable person that you can think of, you know? And um, who's, like, the person who, like, if they show up and, like, they're on the other side of a hallway and you have to walk in the same direction, you would be, like, in the worst mood about it. You'd just be, like, <sighs> and, you know. Uh, <laughs> who is the person you just really, really, really think, like, there's no way that God would ever try to save them or ever could save them? Think about that. This guy is like that, except he's, like, probably much worse than anyone that comes to your mind. Yeah, and he's like, you know, I mean, he's just like harming himself. He's causing damage to, you know, he, he's just like, and, and again, you have to wonder, like, why did they try to bind him? I mean, what, what does he do, you know? Has he like, <laughs> I mean, maybe he like runs around and like steps on chickens or, you know, I don't know. But he, uh, maybe he has like some kind of a, a, a bread smashing compulsion and runs around and like takes your bread and smashes it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Yes, he, <laughs> and he throws bombs and <laughs> and and boomerangs and. <laughs> yeah, he's just like a, a Krampus or something. <laughs> you know, actually, that's something I should do for the Christmas party. Maybe I should do like a quiz on like Christmas lore. Is it real or not? Yes, that would be good. Um, like, which of the following Christmas monsters is is actually in tra in real traditions? But anyway, so yeah, this guy. He's, he's pretty darn lost, right? Like, I would be intimidated if this guy showed up. Um, and uh, <laughs> I don't know that I would be able to do what Jesus did, you know, as far as, like, I would waver. I would, I would fear. I wouldn't seek him out, which is something that's interesting, too, um, <clears throat> is, like, you know, Jesus walks into the region, and surely he knows this guy's going to confront him, you know? Um, so it kind of makes me think about, you know, just think about this guy as the one lost sheep in the parable of the lost sheep. Um, now the tax collectors and sinners, this is Luke 15, 1, uh, were all gathered around to hear Jesus. Um, actually, wait, I'm going to skip ahead. No, this, this is good. Yeah. All right. So starting with verse 1, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus said, uh, told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Um, so think about this. This guy, you know, 
totally demon possessed. Like, I don't know what he does, bread smashing, stepping on chickens, whatever. I don't know. But, but like, all of heaven is rejoicing over him. Think about that. Literally, like, all of heaven is rejoicing over this one man who repents. And think about also, think about this. I think this is really good perspective. How much ability did that guy have to save himself? Zero. zero. Absolute zero. Yes. And, um, you know, depending on what kind of, like, you know, stream of Christianity you're from, you may have heard teachings that will emphasize this, like, more than others. But, you know, just, like, the idea that um, we really can't save ourselves. Obviously, we can't. You know, think about John 3, where Jesus says, like, you know, a man must be born again. And, uh, and Nicodemus is like, how is it possible for a man to be born again? And he basically says that, like, this has to be a work of the Spirit, is the short version of Jesus' answer. You can look it up in Luke, or, uh, John 3. But, like, we, we cannot save ourselves. Um, there's plenty of scriptures to back that, you know, we cannot save ourselves. And that's kind of the point of the gospel, really, right? I mean, wouldn't you guys agree with that? Um, but in the case of this guy, like, we see it. And really, I mean, it's like looking in a mirror. <laughs> you know, whether we admit it to ourselves or not. Like, like we are just totally a captive to, like, you know, our own sin, the things that oppress us. You know, it's just like we cannot save ourselves at all. And But he does the only thing that we really can do. He runs to Jesus and basically says, have mercy on me. And there's more rejoicing in heaven over that guy, you know, than the 99 sheep in the parable. That's really interesting. Um, I have a friend, um, Phoenix knows her, her name's April, but, um, she, yeah. Oh, I mean, I don't think it's like, you know, <laughs> I don't think it's like, oh, now you're saved, we don't care about you. I don't think it's like that. Actually, there's, um, you know, uh, there's plenty of um, places, even in the Psalms, where it talks about God rejoicing in his people and stuff like that. But just like the joy of that initial repentance moment is so great that I think it's like, you know, just like arrest heaven's focus and attention in, in, in that sense, not away from God, but, you know, praising him for what he's done. That's how I would read it personally. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But I would say it's, it, you know, one way to look at it is not like, oh, one of my sheep wandered off. That's okay. I have 99 more. No, this is like I am going to at all costs go after the one. Isn't that interesting? You know, and then when the one comes back, like, there will be such rejoicing. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and it's really interesting, too. Like, you know, if you just think about the different places in Scripture where, you know, Number one, we have what we opened with, you know, that, that death nor life nor angels nor powers nor, uh, you know, all these things can separate us from the love of Christ. Like, he will pursue, you know, through all kinds of stuff, you know, through all kinds of resistance on our part. And, um, and that doesn't mean you want to tempt his grace by rebellion. Absolutely not. Um, it does talk about in a few different places, like, seek the Lord while he may be found. If you turn long enough, you know, there will be a point of no return. Um, but, um, but he is so patient. You know, it even, it's interesting if you look at like, um, even when Israel was in slavery for 400 years in Egypt, do you guys know why they were in slavery for 400 years? There's a little bit of commentary in the book of Deuteronomy, just a little bit. But if you dig and you find it, it's a little obscure place and I, I can't find it. Um, probably, maybe I can, maybe I can word search it and find it. It wasn't that. Well, there was, um, yeah, that's different. Um, yeah, that's later. <laughs> so um, I can't find it right now, but um, it, it explains it basically like, you know, he was giving the people in the promised land 
time to repent. Isn't that crazy? Like, he let his own people stay in slavery longer so they would have time to repent until they reached that point where they just absolutely wouldn't, and he knew that. So, um, yeah, just the, the amount of... Oh, I, I went away from the story about uh, April that I was going to say. I think I'll come back to that. <laughs> Lord help us. I'm usually more organized than this. Um, <clears throat> there's all kinds of verses that are really interesting about, you know, just like how God, you know, there is such a thing as, you know, the elect, there is such a thing as predestination, and yet there are also these verses, you know, you gotta, you gotta reconcile all of them together, um, but, uh, take a look at Matthew eighteen fourteen, for example, uh, do I have a volunteer? Yeah, go for it, um, what about First Timothy 2, 3 through 4, thank you, um, two passages in Ezekiel, or two verses in Ezekiel 18, one of them is 23, and the other one is 32, which would make you just think you're dyslexic, but no, <laughs> Uh, someone want to take that? And bear in mind, this list is not comprehensive. There's other verses that say the same thing as these. Um, uh, Ezekiel 18, and uh, one is 23, and the other one is 32. So let's start with, um, uh, let's actually start with the Ezekiel one. Well, let's start with First Timothy. How about that? Cool. Yeah. Two, three, three, four. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, he's actually talking about, in context, he says to give prayer for all men, and first of all, you know, like your rulers, your authorities. Um, but then he follows that by saying, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Isn't that interesting? He desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. All right, uh, let's do Ezekiel uh, 18 if you got it. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord. Continue. And not that he should turn from his ways and live. Okay, yeah, this is verse 32, so jumping ahead. Great, and in another translation, it says, For I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Therefore, turn and live. And it's with an exclamation mark. It's like pleading with them. Um, so, like, this is kind of crazy. It's like, <laughs> you know, he's just like pleading, like, come back, come back. Um, and um, finally, let's go to Matthew eighteen fourteen. Yeah, it is not the will of my Father in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. He's talking about the children in front of him. Um, but, you know, and, and that's Jesus kind of, I think, embodying the same idea. So then here's the question, like, does God want people to be stuck in bondage? You know, does he want them to be in condemnation? Does he want them, you know, to be um, in anything other than right relationship with him? And how much did he want us, you know, how much did he want to redeem us, you know, to the point of dying? Uh, I mentioned John 3, <laughs> and of course, what's the most quoted verse of like all of the Bible? Yeah, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Um, this was pre-planned, you know, foreordained before the creation. He knew we would rebel, and yet it says before the foundations of the world, the land was slain. So it was already purposed in his heart, in his mind, that this creation is going to cost me my life, but I will do it anyway so that I can redeem them. Um, so <clears throat> that's very interesting. And so, you know, if it's not God's will for people to die, you know, it, in the sense of like he says, like, I desire all men to be saved. And, um, you know, it is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Then, you know, you kind of have to ask questions about like, why? <laughs> you know, why is it that people need to be saved in the first place? Um, and I think the most obvious, without getting too theologically deep, and I don't want to get very deep into this because it is, you know, I, I, this is, this kind of gets in the area where, um, I could say something that sounds divisive and I don't mean to, <laughs> um, but, uh, so just, just look at the scriptures themselves. I'm not going to really try to frame them in any way beyond what they actually just say, but, um, we know that sin entered into the world as man chose to rebel. Um, and in doing so, we basically, you know, we, 
ascended our own throne to our own hearts. We dethroned God in our hearts. And he responded to the choice, which is very interesting. And so, you know, we have, like, all throughout, especially, like, Deuteronomy, it says over and over again, today I set before you life and death. Choose life that you may live. So God is continually extending the offer of life. Um, he's continually pursuing and saying, you know what? I can get you out of this. Will you make me Lord of your life? Um, think about how completely unsavable, again, the demon-possessed man was. And all it took was for him to come to Jesus. And I imagine, you know, what was the internal struggle like? You know, his personality against the demons and, you know, and, and, and he... he you know, thrust himself before the guy, or maybe it's the demons that drove him <laughs> because maybe he started it and then they were just like, okay, we can't hide, so let's just take over. I don't know. But um, it's kind of hard to see who's at the wheel at that p moment, but I, it seems to me like quite possibly like he fought and he presented himself to Jesus in spite of what was warring against him, you know? Um, his entire reality was dark. His entire perspective would have been clouded. His thoughts would have been distorted contorted by the enemy. Um, but he saw this glimmer of light and probably had very little understanding except I want to run to it. And that was all it took. We don't need to know how to save ourselves. We just need to know how to come to God because he's the one who saves us. It is by grace you have been saved through faith so no man can boast. We, we don't work into it. We don't achieve it. We don't earn it. We simply come to him and we let him do the work that he longs to do, that he pleads with us to allow him to do. Um, and something that's really important to add on to all of this is so often, you know, especially in the Western church, um, we think about all of this only in terms of salvation, right? Take every bit of this and apply it to sanctification. You know, you can be saved, but you can be really messed up. You can be saved, but still addicted to any number of things that are <laughs> keeping you in bondage. You can be saved, but still have like major wounding in your heart that basically like, you know, predisposes you to run in all kinds of bad directions. You can have, um, you can be saved and not having, not have forgive, given everybody. And then like that puts a huge barrier between your heart and God. Um, and so like you can be saved, but, but still resisting God in various areas of your heart. You know, consciously you can be like, okay, God, I want you to be the, uh, you know, the Lord of my life. But then you may have all kinds of areas where you're not surrendered, or even consciously you may be like, okay, I, I prayed the prayer, and, uh, and now, God, I'm just going to kind of do my own thing, and I'll see you in heaven, you know? Um, but in all areas, like, <laughs> you know, he came that we might have abundant life, and that abundant life is a life of fellowship with him. It's a life of full communion, and there is nothing worth holding on to when that is offered to us. That is, as Jesus said, the pearl of great price, you know, the treasure in the field, um, and yes, that's salvation, but how often does the word talk about living in that abundance and that fullness of joy even now? Not that, uh, not that we're going to see, you know, the absolute fullness of heaven at this moment or anything like that, but, um, you know, as it says even in Psalm 27, you know, I would have lost heart except I believed I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And there's all kinds of places where it talks about just like the joy of his presence even now. And... Um, why would we want to, you know, why would we essentially want to be like running around the tombs harming ourselves when he is there and we can approach him, um, when he's made a way for us to approach him? Um, and in ending, I just want to, um, I want to give us some prayer time. And um, yeah, Brandon, you can be prepared to come back up. Um, and really just like, I don't know, it was funny because I just like had a really hard time figuring out what to do tonight. <laughs> Normally, I can be like, you know, spend a few minutes beforehand and be like, okay, I'll do this, 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 and this. And I, and I kind of feel like, you know, a lot of the time it's really kind of easy to just be like, okay, God, where do you want us to go? And like, I feel like I have some kind of an answer to that. Tonight, I really had to wrestle. And last, actually yesterday, I had to wrestle. <laughs> and like, you know, it's, it's weird for me to try to plan it for more than one day. And I just felt like blocked, you know. Um, but I really felt that for for whatever reason, like, uh, some prayer time will be necessary tonight, like, important tonight. So I don't want to continue beyond this, except just to just to say, as Brandon's coming up, and you can just start playing as soon as you get up there. Um, I had this friend, April, and uh, she went on a mission trip to Malaysia. And they met a guy who, you know, I think is probably about, <laughs> you know, a lot like this guy in, in the Gadarenes or Gerasenes or whatever. Um, 
he came to a church service where they were, and he had made it his mission in life to murder Christians. He had literally sold his soul to the, to the devil, and he said, my entire life will be about murdering Christians. But he met God. God pulled him out of that. And I don't know the story of how, but there he is in a church service. And so then this, this, uh, you know, this lady, April, you know, she, she comes in from the U.S. and like, hey, can you pray for this guy? And they tell her about him. And she's getting ready to pray for him, and, you know, I'm sure nervous. <laughs> and, I mean, first of all, just think, what would you do there? I mean, wouldn't that be intimidating? You know, could you love somebody like that? Um, you know, could you, could you pray for them? Um, <laughs> would you just be terrified? I don't know. But as she's getting ready to pray for him, her, she's just kind of thinking, you know, her mind's just kind of going. She's like, you know, probably, you know, God has, has like some kind of a plan for his life to, you know, out of the, out of what he's experienced, you know, be able to serve him in a particular way or like, you know, maybe he can minister to people who are caught in like Satanism or whatever. Um, but as she's thinking these things, it was like God just arrested her attention and just spoke very clearly to her. Don't you dare tell him I saved him for any reason except to love him. God wanted fellowship with that man. His heart was wrecked that that man was in bondage. And that was enough. You know, that was enough. And we don't see ourselves that way. How often do we see ourselves that way, that, that God would have died for us just to love us, just for us to love him? But that is the reality. And um, if he would go after the one, and if even the one is a man like the man in the Gadarenes or a man like this guy in, in Malaysia, um, we have hope. We have so much hope. So um, let's just spend some time in prayer. If you want anybody to pray for you, um, feel free to grab someone. Uh, I'm available, <laughs> whoever's available. Um, but Father, I ask right now, Would you minister the love of the father who came running after the prodigal? God, would you show us what it meant that we are the reward of your suffering, Jesus? That nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Right now, Lord God, we choose not to run we choose not to put up defenses against your love. And God, where we experience fear of letting you in, I pray right now that you would um, minister with your perfect love that casts out all fear. Abba, we, we reach out to you. And we know that if we ask you for bread, you won't give us a stone. Speak to us. Holy Spirit, breathe upon us. Awaken us to the reality of who you are, God, and how you love us.